Hello, everybody. Um, my name is John McAuliffe. Um, I work as associate publisher um, here at Carcanet, and I'm really delighted to welcome you to tonight's event. We're going to be launching The Fourth Sister um, by Laura Scott. It's Laura's second book, and I'm going to say more about it in a minute. But first of all, I wanted to um, to give you the usual uh, housekeeping um, for these uh, Carcanet Zoom readings. Um, the event is going to last um, just under an hour, and it would be great, and some of you have already started doing it, if you could um, tell us uh, where you're from, uh, where you're watching us from tonight, um, and uh, let us know you're there in the chat. Um, if you are using the chat, make sure that you set the default setting to everyone, um, rather than just the hosts and panelists, so that everybody can see um, what it is you're saying. There's another little box in the bottom there, Q and A, and if you have questions um, for Laura, um, please drop your questions uh, into the Q and A, and we'll um, pick those up um, after um, Laura and I have um, talked a little bit about the poems as well. Um, during the readings, um, we're going to have the poems up on screen as well, um, and so you'll be able to um, watch and hear um, Laura reading, but also you'll be able to follow the poems on the page, and it's up to you um, which you want to make your main screen, um, so you can switch that around um, with your um, with your cursor uh, at home. Um, if you have any problems about anything to do with this, just um, pop a question in the chat to me, um, and, um, and we'll sort that out. Um, there's going to be an email tomorrow um, for everybody who's attending tonight with how to um, use your discounted um, uh, purchase code um, for the Carcanet shop. So you'll expect you can expect to get that um, in your email um, tomorrow. So I think that's all of the um, bits and pieces before we get started with the main event tonight. Um, Laura Scott's first book, So Many Rooms, was one of the most well-received debuts of the last decade or so. It won the Seamus Heaney Prize, and it was welcomed by our friend Michael Simmons Roberts for being for having short lyrics on big canvases, poems which are mythic, ambitious, and richly engaging. Partly the scale that Michael observes in these poems of Laura's has to do with the audacity of the poems. And that audacity is just as evident in her wonderful new book. These poems possess a really uncanny ability to convince us that they have been and known where, to quote one of the poems, the myths are still soft when they leave your lips. In the Fourth Sisters, the vista and the scale um, remain ambitious and richly engaging. As you're about to hear, um, Laura returns to Russian fiction, to paintings, to Greek myth, as she thinks about sisterhood and about family. The poems do a lot more, though, than acknowledge the past. They think deeply about inheritance and about, um, and about family. What, what they do suggests the ways in which the past, as in one poem's amazing image as a boring king, must be negotiated, reimagined, or even outlasted. One of the things I noticed about Laura's poems right from the get-go was the confident ease with which she threads together um, short and long sentences and the amazing mastery of line as she winds those sentences across the page. And it's something you'll really be able to see tonight as you see the pages and hear her read the poems. Um, this mastery and ease makes her a poet that I instinctively trust um, when I read her poems. And I suppose what I also love about the poems is their obvious preference for questions. Um, I mean their interest in questions rather than in answers. Laura has drawn in a quotation from William Wordsworth, another poet who is no stranger to hard feelings and difficult situations. And it's an amazing touchstone of a quotation, and I'm going to ask her about it afterwards. Um, but it's a touchstone her poems are true to, which sees the poet as upholder and preserver, carrying everywhere relationship and love. So I'm going to welcome Laura on to read from The Fourth Sister. Hello. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, John. Um, I'm going to start with three Chekhov poems. Uh, the first one is the first poem in the book, 
So it's called Short Story. Um, where's the poem? Um, there we go, right. Um, and I just wanted to say one thing about this poem before I read it, which is that it's a it's kind of like an anti-biography poem, really, because it's about how it's better um, to not know what the motivation is. I mean, we don't know what the motivation is behind things most of the time. And I, I kind of felt I found the story in a biography of Chekhov, but then I did I don't I find that move of claiming to understand the motivation behind something. Um that was something I wanted to pull away from. Okay. So short story. There's a story about Chekhov I love, and I'm not sure why. How the night before he left for Sakhalin, he was terrified of being saddled with a ball for a traveling companion. And because the journey was long, really long, three whole months long, all the way east as far as you could go across Russia's great girth, he had to do something, but what? Lacking whatever that trait is, the one that would have allowed him to just say no, he put out a story instead or rather urged a friend to unleash it discreetly and apparently reluctantly into the right circles, to let it be known that although everyone covered up for him, the famous writer was in fact a drunk and a swindler, a nihilist actually, and to crown it all in a final audacious swap, a ball. And if the truth were known, nobody in their right mind would want to sit next to him. And the story was so perfect, so balanced between telling and withholding, it worked. Okay. The next poem um, is a poem I wrote after I'd seen Rebecca Frecknell's um, production of The Three Sisters, which was really a bit of a bit stunning um and i was sitting right in the front row at the side of the stage um not and i it was just i so kind of wanted to to go up to be in the play there was something about the way she did it anyway and i kept thinking um that, that sensation of being drawn in was something I wanted to write about. So this is the poem I wrote. To be one of them. To be a link in that necklace of sisters. To flip between them and forget sometimes which one I am, the oldest or the youngest or the one in between. To slide into their space and find my way into the room they spend so much time in, talking and talking to feel the pattern in the threadbare rug under the sole of our black lace-up boots, feel its colours fade and bleed as we pace up and down, flinging out our lines as if we were scattering seeds into the stalls before I flop down into a chair and sigh or maybe laugh. To watch the staircase fold and collapse under the weight of all our talked thoughts piled up on each other like a litter of puppies scr scrambling for milk, to talk and talk, to slow life's ruin down by playing it backwards and to love the sound of it, the note of longing seeping in and out of me and everyone around me in that room, on that stage and in that theatre and knowing that really that's all there is. This is this is the last of the Chekhov poems. Three Chekhov poems, actually, like three sisters. I hadn't thought of that. Um, this is a poem. Um, I didn't write a word of this poem. This is a poem uh, made out of letters between him and Olga Knipa, who's the 
who was in lots of his plays and who he eventually married. Um, and I was reading them and writing little bits of them out in notebooks because I didn't want to forget them. And then um, it just it just kind of grew into a poem. Um, but the voices, I've kind of moved them around so they're not, you know. Right, so I'll read it. Why are you silent? Another day and no letter from you. Life is so dreary without them. For the love of God, right, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. I would like to write to you, but I can't. Write me a beautiful letter. Write what you feel, write what you want, whatever your pen dictates. I can't think of anything new or interesting. Most of the time is boring and boredom is useless and absurd. I live, as, I live a stupid, absurd life. Oh, how tedious it is to live. Even more tedious to know the tedium is your own. Everything is as it was. I expect nothing. It's been raining quite stupidly for two days. The dampness here, the grey, lowering skies. Damp centipedes are climbing the walls. Frogs and baby crocodiles are playing in the garden. I want to see you awfully. I so wish you were here. I would chat to you about joy and sorrow. I would set out a game of patience with nice torn cards. Your hand, I kiss your hand, hard, hard, hard. Don't forget me, otherwise I shall drown. Remember me, I remember you, in the way we discussed Uncle Vanya, and I was dying with laughter inside. I took some powder, heroin, and I feel pleasantly calm. Do you love me? Do you believe me? Are you lonely without me? Do you eat well at dinner? Do you quarrel with your mother? Are you kind to Masha? Try and answer all my questions from now on. Write more about yourself. Tell me everything. I have nothing to offer. Oh yes, one thing. I caught two mice today. I just wanted to tell you I have such a strong desire to live a happy life. You're not laughing at me. You do understand. Tell me, do we really understand even a fraction of life? Write the essentials so there won't be two stamps on the envelope. I write appallingly like a schoolgirl. I'm ashamed of my letters, terribly ashamed. There's nothing of me in them, nothing of my real self. Where are you? A century has passed without a letter from you. What does it mean? I really love it when you talk about things. Your sweet, glorious letters give me unusual pleasure. Come quickly, I want to see you. I'm swimming. Okay. Oh, this poem. Um, this poem, hopefully you were all looking at the photograph on the cover when you were waiting to come in. Um, this, because this poem is about that photograph, but it's also, there's a kind of quite a strange thought process behind it. Um, my experience of Carcanet has been entirely positive. They're the most wonderful publisher like it says in the bag, I think they're the best publisher in the world. Doesn't it say that on the black bag? But anyway, everything, they've always been really lovely, but I suddenly got it into my head that they wouldn't let me have this photo on the cover. I don't know why, I just imagined that they'd say, no, you can't. So um, I wrote a poem about it and then snuck it into the collection and then thought, if they said, no, you can't have that, I'd, I would be able to say, well, there is actually a poem that goes with it. So anyway, this is the poem. Cover photo. The horse leaning into the gallop, head and tail conjuring a perfect diagonal is the poem, strung like a cello, spotted with snow. And the woman running towards him, leaning the same way, head and hem of her long black coat, a parallel diagonal. The woman is what? Hmm. 
Right. Uh, um, this poem, Joy, uh, this came out of a workshop that I did with Michael Simmons Roberts, and it was really brilliant. And he, we had to pick, it, it was about allegory and sort of obstruction, and we had to pick, do an allegorical poem, and there had to be something that happened that was like an obstruction and or something we had to negotiate, something, something that didn't work. So I picked joy. Um, so joy. So there you are, laughing in the middle of all those people. I saw you when I pushed open the window to let the night in, saw how they surrounded you, how they wanted you, a bit of you, how they hung upon your words. So I left the party thrumming behind me and came out into the garden. How could I not? And as I got closer, I saw how the air thrilled around you, spinning and fizzing. And I wanted to ask you, I so wanted to ask you how long you'd stay and whether I'd see you again. But I knew if I did, as soon as the words left my mouth, you'd think of leaving. So I drank you in instead and pointed to the end of the garden. And there was something about the way you turned, the line of your neck perhaps, or the angle of your head, told me you'd come with me. So I asked and you said, yes. So we peeled away from the others, but then the noise of the party got louder and they were playing a song I could tell you loved. And the people rushed back to the house to dance and you went with them. And who was I to stop you? Right, now um, we've got some, we've got, we've got some boring poems. Now, um, I'm quite interested in being bored um in that state but this this poem um i think it's well it's a, it's a strange kind of poem that i don't it was unexpected when i wrote it uh to me i mean it seems to be a poem where family and story and fairy tales are all kind of doing their own thing and then growing in a kind of vine around each other. Um, the Boring King. If the past were a tree lying on its side and I were to go to it with a saw in my hands and rest my knee on its trunk until I found the stillness in the blade before I pulled it back and forth through the wood, the teeth might snag on a knot as if it were a piece of bone and pictures of me and my sisters might spark off the teeth. There wouldn't be any of you. My bleak father, the king of an island where the trees don't grow, and us, the three princesses, who fell asleep the moment you began to speak. And as you talked on and on into the night, our sleep grew sweeter and our hair grew longer and thicker around us. One sunny day, we woke to find you gone. Now, this poem um, went into the collection really late, actually. Um, and I really love this poem. I don't think you're supposed to say that about your own poems, but I do. I just love this poem uh, it's called The Bored Cowboy. And what about the blackbird singing his big, strong song from the heart of the tree? Let's go back to that, to how loud it was and how hidden he was. So at first it seemed the whole tree was singing as if every branch and every leaf had opened its throat and how clear and green the sound was, stopping me and drawing me towards it until my eyes found a path through the leaves and I saw him, centre stage, 
the garden's own opera singer, flown in that morning, framed by painted boards of magnolia leaves, how everything else just fell away as if the cowboy who slinks in every day and leans against the wall, stringing his rope with trinkets and worries and spinning it in a hoop around me, got bored and dropped it to the ground so there was nothing between me and the sound, and I saw it, saw the sharp orange beak open and close. Um, 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 right, the first sister. So, what um, do I say about this? This is, I've, well, again, this is like the the bald cowboy. This poem came really late, uh, and it came after we decided to call it the fourth sister, actually. And I remember thinking, if I'm going to do that, it might be fun to have another sister. Um, so. Yeah, this is, it, and it's one of those, I'm, talk, I'm sort of sounding like there are a category of these of poems like this, but sort of strange, clear poems. Um, and yeah, I think this is one of them. The First Sister. They can't remember who, but someone had said she was obtuse. None of them really knew what it meant, so it didn't brush her with its wings. It just floated off and left her untouched and undefined, balancing on the stair like a note that slipped off a stave. They loved her when she did that, when she stood still on one foot on the top stair, so full of purpose. But they hated her when she wandered off into one of the low-ceilinged attic rooms and reached up for the doorframe, her bent fingers looking for its ledge so she could swing back and forth as if the house had hands and they were pushing her. Okay. Um, yeah, the fourth sister. I'm, I don't, I don't uh, know what to say about this poem except um except that i think it might i don't know whether there's something about the kind of tyranny of stories in this the way you get the way they place the way the story the sisters in a story are placed the first one's like this the second one's like this so i think i was think that was in my head when i wrote this the fourth sister unsung unrung undone. Is that me? Oh God, is that me? Why do those three words toll so heavily in my head? Did someone slide into my room as I lay asleep like the old king in his orchard and pour them into the dark canals of my ears? All night they've coursed through me, mingled with my blood, swilled and sluiced their way into my heart. And now they're me and I'm them. Unsung, unrung, undone, uneverythinged. The fourth sister, the one who slips the story's collar. Right, there's only two more poems left. Um, so this one is kind of self-explanatory really last words I don't know if it is self-explanatory but anyway I'm going to say that it is last words she said don't grieve me too long and he said no more jokes now bye and when you line them up side by side like that they slot together quite well as if they were two halves of something that once were together, a mother and a father maybe, 
dying in different rooms, in different beds, in different parts of the same city, like the punchline of a joke you don't quite get. Okay. There, this is the last one. And um, this, this is, I don't know, I think this might be the oldest poem in the book. Um, and because, and it's the last, oh yeah, it's the last poem in the book. So, but because it's the oldest, it's, it feels like I didn't write it. Um, so it's, it's, and I, and I really like that. It's interesting to have a poem that feels like that. Uh, I think that's all I need to say about this one. Okay. These lines, all these lines to remember, all these lines you'll forget. The lines of birds forming and breaking, breaking and forming, breathing an imperfect V across the sky. And the lines that crease our palms, blown across our hands, heart lines, life lines, folding and deepening, starring and intersecting, lines the palmist longs to see. And the lines that fissure and sucher the skull, fusing plates of bone together to shield the yoke of brain. Rilke dreamt of playing them, of running a needle across their groove so he could hear those wavering lines scratch out their truth. All those lines meandering, drawn by the same thing. All those lines to remember and lines to forget. Okay, thank you. Okay. So wonderful to hear the poems, Laura. I thank could you. listen to you read them all night long. Just fantastic. <laughs> um, I, I, I wondered if I could pick up something from the last poem, which is about poetry and, and remembering um, and poetry and forgetting. Yeah. Just say something, because there's a kind of a delicious emphasis on forgetting sometimes in the poems alongside how you remember such amazing details. And I wondered if you could say something about that thing the poems can do. Um, about forgetting how the poems yeah, and yeah. About, about both about both of them really yeah I suppose um, I'm very I'm fascinated by um, by the by our inability to remember properly it's like that's what I want to do I want the poem to to freeze something and so it's there but then I think the this kind of secret resistance to that, the way that it, the way that things won't let themselves be turned into photos is um, kind of, I suppose, beautiful. That's, 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 I want to, I want to get the forgetting in as well. Um, and yeah. And, and, and I was thinking when I was introducing lots of the poems, there were so many times where I wanted to say, I don't un, I don't know what's happening in this poem. I'm kind of amazed and delighted by it, but I don't I can't pin it down and explain it. And yeah. that's that thing about which memories, which about not it's not even memories, but just some things that stick like a burr to you, and you don't know why you've got such a precise sense of that. And that's what I'm uh, I'm interested in. But then the way it's it's precise and blurred at the same time. Yeah, yeah. this is amazingly kind of almost magnetic about the way the images kind of constellate in the poems, and it just feels like like that image of the birds sticking to 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 you as you write is is really lovely for that. Yeah, I mean it's that's what I, I, I think I said something about that ages ago when I first got a new poetry. But that's what I that those sorts of thoughts that you can't um, you can't process and you can't work out why they're so why they won't go. What, an image won't go or a sound or and those I I always want to kind of lay those out in poems and yeah. I think I think poems like that that like that kind of thing it's like it, they kind of roll over and yeah. It'll, yeah 
Now I'm going to ask you a question that I, I, I hate anybody ever asking anybody. I'm just because you've said this though, and it's, it's about your process a little bit. My goodness. Okay. Sorry, but like, you know, the, so if you talk like in terms of how the images gather and about how they accumulate as you think about the poems or, and it's interesting, you often, like you often mentioned as you're reading them there about how, well, this was the oldest poem in the book and this one's quite new. And, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit just about the individual poems and how they gather those images together? Yeah, I, mean, I, could, I suppose I could say something about the new ones first because I was thinking when I was doing my little kind of uh, praise thing for Carcanet, which was far more clipped than I wanted it to be, one of the things that was really nice about working on The Fourth Sister was that uh, I was working you know, with jazz on it and there were a lot of it felt like it wasn't settled. There were so many new ways that it could go. And I suppose I I was aware that like um, the first sister and the bored cowboy, those two poems and cover story, the cover photo one, all of those were kind of much more nimble and fluid than the way I normally write poems. They came very quickly and I think that was because I was so immersed in poems at that time. I was looking through them, changing little bits, do, working on sort of three or four at the same time. Um, and that's, I, I love working like that. Yeah. Um, but some of the older ones, I think I did take much, look much longer with and um, an image I don't know. Actually, it's such a good. That's such a good question, though, because the, I just feel the the new ones that I'm, that I'm more in love with. I think they've there was a di very different way in which I wrote those, and I don't know whether it was to do with them being more sociable. Whether I knew that I was sending them off and that Jazz was going to read them, and whether we were not, they were going to go in, and that. So they seem the other ones seem more solitary, um, and and yeah. I see actually Jazz has a question and um, in, and it's a little bit about, it's actually, it's a question about whether the poem starts from a clear image. Yeah. Um, what the first image is or do they develop or do you, do they shed, do you shed them as the poem evolves or? Just trying to think, right. We think of, um, I don't think they, like the, the one about seeing the three sisters, to be one of them that didn't start from a clear image at all it was the sensation of being in the theater being but i mean that is in the poem isn't it to be there to be blah, blah. so yeah it the, it, it was a, it was it, it wasn't something that I, I i didn't even have a line for it i just knew i wanted um and i, I suppose i knew actually no i did with that i knew because I couldn't remember which sister was which. And I I haven't read the play. I've just seen it. And so I always say that one or that one and somebody else normally fills me in what their name is. So I thought I wanted to, that's the same thing you're talking about, about the blur. So I wanted to get, and I love the thing that I came up with about the necklace and the being yeah. three and to be moving between them. Um, so, and there was and there was a lot of movement in the play, the, the production. You know, they were sort of moving around the stage a lot. So yeah, it was a, it was it was like a gesture rather than an image that I wanted to get. I suppose that was the starting thing for that poem, and that quite often happens actually. Yeah, no, that that is that is very interesting. Now I'm going to have to come back to Chekhov and theatre versus fiction in a minute, but I want to ask you about sisterhood first, okay. and about <laughs> sisters, because I was thinking about this. And, and I've been thinking about it in relation to the book, and I've been thinking about the way that, you know, sisters and family and that kind of closeness and a sense of a private language. And I was remembering the amazing Marilyn Robinson novel, Housekeeping with the Sisters Down oh, by the yeah. Rose in the Water, and this amazing kind of life that they live, which is sort of self-contained and, um, yeah, and seems to have everything in it. And I, I wondered if you could maybe just talk a little bit about, about sis sisterliness. Yeah. Um, well, um, I think the thing that I think with sisters, or even just the word, it's like as soon as it's so reverberant, as soon as I put it in a poem, or as soon as I say sisters, it just 
instantly like first of all it instantly opens up the story of the three sisters the the kind of the fairy tale one about you know the gold and the salt and the or the leer or the you know it just goes boom, big straight away um and then I suppose I am one of three sisters uh that's maybe got something to do with it about the way that when we were growing up there was a sense of like which sister is like you know which one are you one sister has to be this one sister has to be that one sister um and that was kind of interesting and restricting and yeah. kind of clever and stupid at the same time and I would just was um but I think it I think it's and the and the thing of the clo I love the idea of the you know like in the Marilyn Robinson the, the the closeness of the sisters being shattered um I find that very it's just it's just like a magnet I just find that it's um it's something that I don't know whether other people have this but there are some things that if you that just seem to me to want to go into poems that you can do you know like trees are like that and windows and sisters you know you just can they just keep on they just keep on giving you things they're so generous and that yeah that's what yeah that's what I feel about the sister thing I, I like that the trees and windows yes but I hadn't heard sisters being used sisters. in that way before but I see it yeah it's yeah, no, it's, it's like it's like the the fairy tale thing, and the yeah, I just think it's and the it's, way. Uh, sorry, one more thing. There's the way it's a kind of model of friendship as well for people to say, "Oh, you're like my sister." You know, sort of a certain kind of female friendship. I don't know. Oh. And it's got it. It automatically brings another relationship that you don't even have to talk about when one is on the page. There's a sense of another world, that sociable world you're talking about just comes into play immediately with the first sister, you know, when she's hanging on the door frame with the yeah. house or out, <laughs> it, the others are the others are there without you even knowing. And, and that thing in the in that poem about. Um, I remember um, what, what, the way that it's got, they loved her when she did that and then they hated her when she did that, that sort of the way that the sisters can turn you know it can be and then it can be kind of horrible and loving and and one sister being pushed out and one sister um mm -hmm. I, yeah that sort of that, that is this sort of sister logic that's yeah. very interesting no that's great now i am going to have to ask a question here about chekhov and i was going to say ask you about this but actually michael um schmidt michael asks um, do you get your love of boredom from Chekhov, um, whose characters are almost always balanced between telling and withholding, and, and he observes that this is a wonderful aesthetic because it leaves so much space for the reader, and he wonders if that's why he loves your poems so much. So, oh, what, a um, lovely, what a lovely question. Thank you. Yeah, I think I, I, I'm sure that's why um, I love, one of the reasons I love Chekhov so much is that the peop people are sitting around having the same conversations uh that you know they've had um for years and years and years and that that well it, the thing about boredom it's it's so weird i was th i was thinking about it because on the you know when i had to write the blurb thing to go on the back of the book i i wanted to say something about how they were love poems kind of to time about mm. time but then I thought oh god that's too big there's too th so many that's just then I'll have to kind of back back it up but I was thinking I just I think that the boredom that I'm interested in in the in that they're not interested in I just kind of zoomed in on it when I saw that Chekhov was doing it doing it so well is is to do with the way that boredom slows time down to so it reveals itself in all its kind of magnetic once so you can hear you know you can literally the way that three minutes feels like four hours and I just found that thickness of time that sort of slow clogged time in Chekhov's um work was something I wanted to kind of echo and pick up on um yeah. And it just, it just, like the sisters, it just kind of, it just sort of went. It just sort of came in 
it's so generous it kind of came in and and being bored is just yeah uh, <laughs> i just think about it all the time about, <laughs> about, about that um do you have favorite Chekhov plays and stories no it's funny i really really no i don't every single oh. time I, I see one of them all right it's this one i mean i think it's the th i think it's the three sisters because that's the last one i saw um yeah. But I haven't, I've got to read more of the stories and because I just wonder, I've never written anything. I've written things about the plays and I've written things about the letters. I don't know if I could get anything about a story. I mean, I might try and do this, but maybe because I'd love to write some more, actually. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> I, mi I miss him. I miss him. I think the, the, the letters were, I mean, it's funny also just about the the boredom thing. You know, I was reading the letters in lockdown when nothing was happening and then you know they're both in the wrong place yeah. and bored and want to be you know so that it just kind of it, it, the whole book is kind of surrounded in that boredom time but it's an amazing tone that runs throughout your book though um it Thank does you. it's like it is like a well of time to dip into all of these poems um i i wanted to ask you there, there are a few really, really interesting questions that have come up in the Q&A, and I'm, I'm going to put a couple of them together in a minute, but yeah. I wanted to ask you about the second book and about, um, uh, and I think it's Rachel Spence has, has asked this question as well in the chat, and about, oh, you know, Rachel. what has changed in between the, you know, when you're writing towards the first book, and it, often it's many years of work and different ways of thinking, and then all of a sudden, a second book can often be kind of more intense and more thrown together in some ways. And did you, what did you think about it? How different did it feel? Um, I found it, um, I found, I found it, I really liked writing the second, I much preferred writing The Fourth Sister to writing So Many Rooms, actually. I, um, what, oh God, what is it about it that was a, there were one or two places where I consciously, I was consciously trying to do a second book. Actually, like what, maybe one poem. And then, yeah, there's one poem that I didn't read tonight, um, which is called The Line. And it's about, it's got kind of three different sections. Um, and what happened was I wrote one uh, and it, it it came to a kind of, a sort of easy end um and I thought oh yeah that's that's it and then I was thinking I remember you know not wanting to sort of having a slight horror about repeating myself impersonating myself in a second collection uh and I thought that's too like a so many rooms poem um mm -hmm. and then I think I think I said something about this when I was in Manchester that then I saw this thing that uh, Caroline Bird had said about you've got to kind of force when you get what, what why don't you try when you've written a poem forcing it on where after you think it's finished into a different stage so it got kind of messier and more unruly and I suppose I was really I really liked it when you said something at the beginning about the audacity because I felt like I had more nerve to do that uh, that's one thing that's different the other thing was that because I was getting, you know, really nice emails from Michael saying, what are you doing? What's happening? Are, are there going to be any more poems? It it felt like, it felt like they were part of a conversation. Um, I know I've said that before, but that's, that's the thing. It felt like the second collection felt much more, um, much more, much more sociable. I was much aware. I was much more aware of people reading them, of them going out to me. Whereas the first book is not like that you know you hope people will read them um and we think whatever and there was I mean I don't want to sort of tempt the gods but there was a sort of I felt slightly more fluent I suppose like I could try things um no that makes that makes uh, that comes across I think that fluency um and also yeah and and the and again the confidence of the writing is sort of is, is amazing all the way through the book now i am going to try and gather together some of these because a lot of people have brought up how talk and speech 
work That's in the so poem yeah. alongside alongside the line. So Oliver Cummins talks about, um, you know, our talk thoughts piled up, and then also a line like "Whatever your pen dictates." And um, uh, uh, Beverly Brack, um, uh, hello Beverly, um, says your poems look beautiful on the page, and is that important um, to you? And uh, there are also, I think Lisa Lisa Kelly. Um, talks about man how you manipulate talk and speech into the lines. So wonder, could you talk a little bit about that the talk. line and then about talk? Um, well, so I'd say something about talk first, I suppose. I've I've always been uh, really fascinated by that, by the way in which people speak, like whether there's a drawl in their voice, whether there's a... I mean, I didn't, I didn't read it, but like there's a poem in there about being talked to in a restaurant by people but by those voice are those uh, I suppose it goes with the boredom thing actually and I kind of get this um that I get slightly hysterical when I'm talking to somebody and you feel this voice is never going to stop it's just like um it's just coming out and out and there's like waves of it and the where you're not being there's no listen no, no listening no dialogue so I've, that for some reason that's like a, a nightmare version of a voice um but I'm kind. Of, I've. I don't know. I. I. I like. I really like. Not so much being interested in what people are saying as the or the way in which the, the the sound the voice makes the kind of, the, the sound the shape of the the, the what are it, what its characteristic gestures are um, and, it's, and with yeah, and with Chekhov, you know, there's a I can't remember who it, who it is, but in one of the plays, it's not interesting. Somebody just says, you know, Uncle, please just stop talking, just stop talking because this they're just you know going on. So, um, uh, so and I like getting yeah, and I love drawing of uh, to go to the line thing and what the poems are. I love drawing a long, a long drawly voice across lines. Um, so there's and. So is there, I just I was just saying the negative things of a long voice. I also love them. I love that kind of languorous, voluble kind of um, yeah. quality. And it's funny, I was thinking, um, God, I hope I'm not turning into one of those voices that never stops talking. That I was just saying. But I, I was thinking about when I first started, who I read um, and who I kind of thought, oh, I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to do that. And I remember really it feeling like a bit of a revelation those kind of those sort of they're all they're mostly all male those american long-lined conversational voluble you know like ck williams and tony hoagland and those those kind of i was and whether where the voice can change can co correct itself in the middle of a line and say no no not that something else but leave it in uh that kind of sprawl i love I, that <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. And so I wanted to, I was like, oh, I want to be able to do that. So I'm tr that's something that, yeah, I, I love to be able to turn it, or to get it over the, to go over the line, to get it to run through the poem, I suppose. Yeah, not just a, not just a line, but just a, to make the, to sort of animate somebody else's voice in a poem. Yeah. Well, that poem, Joy, you know, where it looks like they're going to leave together and then he goes back. Yeah. Oh my God! But it reverses itself a couple of times. You know, it really is sort of an amazing. Uh, you know, it's a yeah, action-packed as well. Action-packed for him, yeah. <laughs> um. So, and again, I suppose there are a couple of questions here which are kind of related to Joe Boyle, and um, we talks about the about language and Peter Adair as well, um, and are thinking a little bit about um just about the about the about how the how the how the language of the poem develops which relates i suppose to that uh, that that sense of voice but there's a question here from jeffrey sugarman which is a great question and it's he's somebody who's obviously read the book um well and he he says there there are so many moving poems of family in the book which he didn't read tonight um and you know that that's another element that's really strong um in mm. the book um and then kind of a separate question which is about how the book does have recurring images of lines and of the of swimming and about and various things which kind of run through the, the the different poems as well 
And if that's part, like, I think you talked a little bit about this in terms of the poems talking to one another as you were writing them towards the end. Mm. Um, so those are those are two questions. And there's just one more question after that, I think. So um, um, the, the, thi the thing about the repeated yeah. images and stuff, um, I suppose I'm not really conscious of those. Um, when I'm writing them um and then when you look back and see I mean like, actually like there's so many stairs in my poems there are about yeah, there are lots of things that get that do get repeated and I sometimes think you need to watch that because it can be like um it can be that they're like the sister thing that it's just something that's rich and generous and will go somewhere in a poem for you but it can also be kind of like where you go when you're idling you know where you when you don't know quite what to do with the poem you you kind of like stick in a tree or something like that um so it was weird when when, when I sent them off to, to you guys I was sort of looking at it and thinking god there's so many I didn't realize there was so much about talk in there and so much talking and talking into the night and I was thinking god I should have taken a few talk talking and talkings out but actually I think um the stuff that comes around the back of you and gets in like that is is good um yeah and the family thing the thing about the poems being about i mean that um i suppose i suppose they just kind of always creep in mm. yeah <laughs> i don't want i don't want them to but they just do um very good. Well, here's a, another a very different question, and I, I like. I think I think it was a really good question, though, because the the poems are can be really sore sometimes. Like they're really mm. they're very moving poems as well. Um, so um, this is uh, Robin Marsak, and um, Robin's um, question is about the writing of the poems as a sort of a self delighting activity, and like and just you know how you how you read them and and the obvious pleasure there is and for us as readers and how they turn mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. and the pleasure you take in them in performance and if you could talk about about that and Robin points out this is really unusual because most poets she doesn't say this but I think she, what she means is they're all so mopey <laughs> that's so funny because that's what so many people not so many one one person in my family my daughter has said that um so many of my poems are mopey, are mopey and I think that's not true actually but it's like it's it is a it is a fear but no I do find them yeah delightful is exactly the word I just think I just I, I quite often I mean, it's like when I said that about the bored cowboy I was thinking can I say I love my own poem you know you should just let other but it's it feels like this I can't believe that I've made something that's like that, that has, because that really was a, a, a day that I was bored and time was going that, you know, clicking, ticking slow, thick and slowly. And then there was this bird. And when I look at that poem, I think, I, God, I've got that. I've got that in those lines and the shape of it's beautiful. And I, I can't believe that, I feel delighted because I can't quite believe that I did that. Yeah. Um, you know, that's that's thing. It, it would be sort of fake modesty, modesty to say, oh, yeah, it's all right. I think it's, you know, I think it's a good <laughs> poem. Um, everybody needs to have that poem. No, no, stop. I've got to go. <laughs> I'm getting tired now, but um, but I just love that poem. And, and I love, um, and I still kind of can't believe that I can write poems. It's the only well, thing. I think it's clear as well from all of the great comments and things that are coming through in the chat that everybody else loves the poems too, Laura. Yes. So it's um, sure? so great. And I'm again, here is the beautiful book. Um, yeah. And so I think we might um, call it a night. Well, it's and, a night. Uh, thank so thank you. thank you so much, Laura. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been, it's been such fun, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm just going to remind everybody that you're going to get an email. Oh, actually, and Lucy, hello, Lucy, is after popping into the chat um, the link for you to be able to buy 
um, to be able to, to be able to buy the book as well, um, not just for yourself, but for your friends to treat them um, and your sisters, maybe um, yeah. as well. Maybe, maybe. Mm. Uh, <laughs> um, and we have a little break between before our next reading now, um, and that's going to be with Kit Fan, who's really wonderful. Um, third book we're publishing, The Ink Cloud Reader. It'll be his first book um, with Carcanet, um, and that's going to be at the end of April. Um, so again, we're really looking forward to that. It's a high bar, though. It's been a real pleasure to hear you read the poems, Laura, and thanks everybody for coming along. Um, tonight and um, we'll leave the comments open for a little while so you can just uh, drop any notes that you like inside there and um, hopefully we'll see you at another one of our um, Zoom launches um, later in the spring. Good okay. night. Good night. Thank you so much.